Hey, welcome everybody. Good morning. Sound check, please. Take care of current business and then we'll address new business. So in the current position, we um, did not get out and that should be a, well, it is a dollar sign. We have a stop at 39.33. That's not going to be too promising to be honest with you in today's environment. We do have a long Wells Fargo. It uh, is slightly still uh, profitable. We do have a long Regions Financial. We have our close stop on this. That's not going to that odds are we're going to get stopped out on that today. Uh, long an option, it's a leap on Newmont uh, option. This is worthless. What happened to TLT? I generally have a trading rule that says half the time, half the value. Half the time passed, but half the value didn't. And going into last week, the option was worth 85 or 87 cents actually uh, coming into the week. And I stated this. I said, listen, I'm willing to hold this because we've had a good run in the market. And at this point, it would be and not that it's my policy to give back any profit, but it was my policy that said if the, if the market continues to rise, if we have Fed stimulus, if President Trump smooths other things or at least doesn't agitate things, and that was the key. He needed not to agitate things. If he could just have held back from agitating things, then it's um, my, the way the market was structured looked as if this thing could have really blown off. Retail was near a, a, a breakout, but it didn't break out. The Russell was near a breakout, it didn't break out. Um, I even addressed that because we were long last week. You could see we had a, a busy week. We were long Twitter. We trailed our stop, they knocked us out, we're out of Twitter. We were long Hess. We trailed our stop. Profitably, our uh, stop got knocked out on Hess. That was a big move for us. I was expecting energy stocks to have great performance last week in earnings reports, and they did for the most part. Uh, Occidental Petroleum. Now, that's one that's sad because I raised the stop up to just above break even. They had great earnings, but the market got dumped and then pumped, knocked us out. So uh, that's okay because by Friday, it went right back down. So that's it. We did get into GlaxoSmithKline last week. And that's why I said if you guys wanted to get out roughly around the, the break even on, on GSK um, or slightly, I think it was trading around 22, I said get out of this thing, 20, 22, something like that. And in the live trading room, only for trade room members got that announcement. And uh, I think there was a couple of our clients that said, hey, guys, uh, what do I do with this person? And I said, listen, it, you know, it, 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 the market's under pressure. We could probably see GSK. It's not a big deal. It could be a tie-up of capital. But I still like the stock. I like the company. And seasonally speaking, this is the best time to get into biotech and drug stocks in the month of August. And we had a lot of drug names go up last week despite and defied the downside in the market. I'll get to that in a minute. But needless to say, uh, we entered long regions financials, and now that's not going to work. We got in and out of uh, fifth five, uh, five networks, and uh, boy, that, that was a, a Trumpism uh, debacle right there. So we, we got clipped on that. We canceled stops in GE. We were long from 10 bucks. We bought the 1050 put, and this expires August 16th. So now with GE trading roughly around $9.80, we're losing 20 cents on, uh, we're virtually in a protective guaranteed profit of 12 cents on that trade. So, I mean, now we can play it until August 16th. So if the stock drops, we can buy back the, or sell, liquidate the uh, long put option and roll into a different put along the way if we wanna therefore hang on to GE. And we'll cross that bread bridge when we get to it. We are in control of that trade because as the stock rallied, we took hedge protection on a put option while we were in profits on the trade. It's a little different than, you know, I guess a good strategy would have also been in that case, a collar strategy, which would have been to sell a call to help finance buying the put. But if the earnings came out and they announced the dividend, that stock would have been up maybe a buck fifty, two dollars I mean, who knows? I mean, it's had some pretty wild moves in the last few years on its way down. I mean, it pops up. So we'll take a look uh, later today on that. Next. Um, we were long a call spread in June in IWM. When the market popped, we sold a call spread, a credit call spread against it. When the market dropped, we took profits on the credit call spread, the bear call spread. When the market dropped further, we bought back the short side of the 160 of the bull call spread, stayed net long the 155. When the market rallied, we sold and took a profit on the 155. And I wish every trade that I did 
was that good taking care of those swings in the market. So that's where we stand. Where are we at now? Um, if the market goes down, I'm hoping that the market goes down and real estate investment trusts get clipped too because we bought the 86 strike September put. We paid a buck and a quarter. We're taking a little heat on that. Um, till rate, pot stocks. It started to come back. We're long from 45. Our stop was 39. It was looking pretty good. It had some good news coming out of one of the, one of the major uh, Canadian pot companies, um, Kronos, I believe it was, or Afria, excuse me. Afria announced a substantial profit in their quarterly basis, which was huge for this industry. I mean, it shows that not only are people smoking pot, but my, my thing about Tilray is they're kind of like a, a grower. And what it is, is that if we finally get more and more consumers, not the smoke pot, I'm not a real fan of that. I'm here to tell you, um, especially this, the kind of stuff they're growing nowadays, which is like numb mining. I mean, it, it, it supposedly puts you in a coma pretty, pretty much. But what I think there's true value is in the medicinal side and topical uh, creams for arthritis sufferers. And boy, when when the elderly, and as you know, our society is getting a little bit older. If you don't believe me, just go to a public golf course on a weekend in the north and you'll see what I'm talking about. And here's the thing. I think for sports athletes that have bruises and uh, compound rubs, man, when this is an additive, THC ad additive, gets uh, more legitimized and legalized, I don't think there's going to be a way to grow enough pot. But I might be, again, substantially early on Tilray, but I didn't like it at 100. I didn't like it at 80. I like it down here. We've traded it twice this year, so there we have it. All right, what about this week? I got a short in Costco. Um, I got really, uh, it needs to rally. I don't think it's going to rally. So there it is, um, bottom line. Uh, I wrote this up over the weekend. It got into everyone's email Sunday morning, way before I knew what was going on with China. So with that said, where do we go from here? And what are we looking at? All right. I, um, if you want to hold off on buying coals on this dip, uh, you can go ahead. If you want to hold off on buying Hess, which I want you to realize where Hess is right now and how much of a decline we need Hess to get to. So let's cover our newsletter right now and let's get into what... Um, what we need to take actions on in the next 14 minutes when the cash market opens. That's the key, all right? And then how are we trading this for the rest of the the, um, the, um, the week? One more thing before I get into that. Hold on one second. Let's get to this. Bear with me. All right, uh, we'll get to that back in a minute. All right, here we go. Um, bingo. Commodities. Equities. Here we go. We're going to go to our um, equity page first and foremost. And you can see, does, you know, right now in the overnight action, we're already seeing uh, tremendous uh, declines in terms of percentage in most of the big sectors, the regionals, the oil, the financials. The irony is that a lot of these sectors already they enter seasonally weak periods of time. So that's what I wanted to discuss. What about the drug sector and the uh, gold and gold miners? Funny thing is, gold in August, seasonally strong. That's why we've held on to our uh, long-term Newmont mining. So I didn't add to that trade per se, but we still have exposure via the long Newmont mining trade. But as we wrote about in this week's thoughts and observations, gold tends to rally during the month of August. Drug companies, healthcare, as well as biotech companies tend to have a strong seasonality lasting on or about the after, keyword, after the first week of August going into mid to late September. Now, I don't know if it's a coincidence factor that you get uh, Congress is off on recess and so the Senate's uh, gone from vacation and they call it a, a constituent uh, period where they go back home. It's really a vacation, right? And so at this point in time, if you take a look at what sectors are doing the worst and what sectors are doing less worse, so to speak, you see biotech right here, IBB only down 1%. It could get a little bit ugly, but still it's at 103. It, a biotech is not trading at, uh, maybe today it will, at 100. 
But here's what we were looking at on the biotech, and we've done our analysis. And I said, I'm not a big fan of getting in until we break out. Even last week, if you noticed, as, as excited as I was about how the market could be bullish last week, friends, um, could be, I said it needs to break out. XRT needed to break out. And again, what got hit the hardest last week? Anything that manufactures anything in China, anything that is... Uh, has investment properties in China, or, and maybe this is the key with the, as I wrote about with Goldman Sachs, maybe they've invested too much and have exposure in companies that produce and manufacture or have exposure to China and are, um, you know, exposed to detrimental effects of these new imposed tariffs. So that's, that's another Avenue and why I've kind of completely avoided Goldman Sachs. It just didn't look great. But with the biotech, we've uh, done our analysis, and this is the person last conditional change. And thanks to Ruth in our trading room, she says, "John, I can't see your gray line." So what we did is we uh, we copied what she did, and what she did is she made it kind of a, a, a fuchsia pink and gray dotted line, so that can we identify this particular candle something that is is it's called the last conditional change i i kind of identified what that really means in this book here 15 years ago the the candlesticks and pivot point and what i look at for for this for example guys we have this kind of declining wedge compression situation and i said like, while it's looking better and the volume's looking good we need a price breakout we got to get over this and close greater than that last conditional change it popped it failed it popped it failed and so I'm still in the same camp. I don't know if we're going to get down to 103. We're there now. I don't know if we're going to break that support and get maybe to 100. But over this week, what I think is going to happen is that we've got follow-through weakness in the market. Okay, great. There's margin call liquidation going on, I'm sure. Now we've got more people involved in getting short the market. And to be honest with you, I think there's still... Um, I'm, I'm not that bearish in the market. I think the market's just doing what it does. It, it continues to overreact. So the, we were possibly anticipating a correction in the market. Our indicators, the McClellan oscillator, a lot of things that we looked at were calling for a, a little correction. I thought we had one more blow off top left in the market. That's what I was looking for really. But I was nervous, I was skeptical, and we cut back on our buying program. So now, where do we go? Um, you know, when I go down and I look at the list of stocks, especially focusing on the biotech, because I, I don't know if we're going to be able to jump on the short side of a Under Armour after it made, for example, uh, bringing it to your uh, attention here, last week, Under Armour's earnings. I mean, you know, this is what I'm not a fan of. And uh, again, I think most of you are well aware of my feelings of I didn't invent volume, number one. Number two, I did not reinvent a new indicator, but what I did is modernize an indicator. And this is on balance volume, and it's a, it's a decent tool still, but it's not my favorite because it gives a lot of false readings in a sense. If the market breaks out and goes to newer highs and it's accumulated with a new high reading and on balance volume, that sometimes doesn't give us the big picture. What the big picture is this volume indicator, which showed that there was a divergence. It actually shows a difference between the on-balance volume, which was going up, and our volume indicator, which was divergence going down. But the real key in looking at a lot of stocks, for example, is this relative strength. And so the setup is simply this, gang. When, when you're looking at prices breaking out, if they're starting to break out and there's divergence between volume and this tool here, it's called the PMC. It's both here on TradeStation platform as well as the um, Thinkorswim. We added that to the Thinkorswim, John Person Lifetime Package there, or the John Person Indicators on Thinkorswim. This is a relative strength that it identifies four stages of market. Outperforming bright blue, weakening uh, against the overall market is dark blue. Uh, relative lagging is red, so if long, red not good. And uh, fuchsia, which means that the market, this fuchsia color, it means that the stock is starting to improve against the overall market. So if it's starting to improve performance, you might get these little, little lift off. So uh, in this trend from April through, let's call it mid-June, there's what, you know, kind of back and forth, but the trend was up and the relative strength was uh, doing just fine. When we get into divergence patterns in the market, not good. There were a lot of names that were diverging, and that's why we were more interested in 
uh, stocks that weren't overvalued. And there's just a huge amount of names that are in this condition right now as we finished the week and the month. And what do I mean by that? Well, that was a divergence on a daily basis, as you just saw. What I see this week is something even more dangerous. And what I see, and I'm gonna point this out to you right now, is that we generated a lot of what we call weekly bearish signals with monthly new sell signals. And that, my friends, is not something I'm a big fan of. It could be the development of another member of ours, and I keep giving him credit because he's been looking for and waiting for um, and been a big staunch bull in gold. So I got to give Mike C a prop and a hands out there to Mike C. Everyone say, hey, Mike, nice. Uh, he's been bullish and he's been on the gold trade. Um, and I, Mike, I don't want to throw you under the bus, but he is a, uh, he's not your, a retail trader. So uh, Mike, though, is we call it the Mike C correction because he's, uh, you know, wants to see this, uh, the S&Ps get back to fair value and, and, and fair value is something like, a, I don't know, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, let's see if I'm wrong, Mike. Is it something like 20% stock market correction you're waiting for in the S&Ps? Uh, that would make you feel bad. But um, his, he's doubled, it's been a double in the past six months for him. No, he says much larger than 20%. Now, here's the thing. I want to go over and uh, give me a second while I line this up here for us. In the charts this week, all right, I want, in, in, and I hope this is being re uh, recorded so that you can all see this, because I did. I don't know if I went over this enough in the live trading room. Sector ETFs and notable, notable stocks, not every stock. I mean, I can't spend... 40 hours going through every single stock. I went through my scans, but here's what I look at, gang. Um, how many stocks generated a weekly sell signal that are in jeopardy of forming monthly low closed OG sell signals? And that's even though the month just started. So let's see, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So I'm gonna go over here uh, and let's take a, a couple of names. Look at this. We have um, the mid cap, the airline stocks, the middies, the IJT is s S&P 600, I believe. Um, we've got IGV. Uh, we have the IYT transports. That makes sense with the airline stocks. Um, we have industrials. Uh, we have Morgan Stanley's, Costco. And that's why I've put up a Costco. I'll share that with you in a minute. Um, Southwest Airlines. Uh, Milko in the casino operator. Steve Wynn, a lot of exposure in China. Uh, Momo, uh, CRM, which is Salesforce and Juniper Network. These were pronounced trades. These are pronounced stocks and ETFs. So what did I mean by this? What does this mean? Let's take a look at DIA, diamonds, Dow Jones Industrial Average. All right, so here's what I was talking about. All right, we got a, we got a PPS sell signal. Well, we knew that. And on Friday, and even in looking at the spies, I said a daily weekly close over under 296, and we're going down. We'll look at that in a minute. But here's what I, is, is interesting. My low close doji uh, is a trade system. And the system, by the way, was written in that book, and it works for day trading. It works for larger term trading. Now, you take the goose with the gander. If you're good for one, it got to be good for the other. We have done phenomenal by picking out weekly high closed OGs, weekly stocks. What about when you get a weekly low closed OG? Well, by the way, here's a this orange candle signifies after a downtrend. Here's a doji, market closes greater than the doji, and here's what I wanted to show you. The distance from the low to the high, one to one risk reward ratio, generally takes eight to 10 bars to get there. So if it's a week, it's eight to 10 weeks. If it's a day, it's eight to 10 days. If it's a five minute, it's what? 40 minutes to 50 minutes, so eight to 10 bars. So to reach a one to one risk reward ratio. Uh, back when we did a back test study, this one it first came out in that book 15 years ago. It was around 72% accurate, and it was um, independently back tested by Genesis Financial using 15-minute bars on the E-mini S&Ps, gold, and I believe we did uh, the Treasury bonds as well. So it was a back testable program. So what did it do? It told us where to get long, where to place our stop loss what our holding period was, and what the profit target. So that's why I say a system, all right? That's what really made that phenomenal. And I think a lot of people missed it because they didn't read through all the bullet points. 
and the bullet points weren't, hey, it's a buy signal. It gave a holding period, a stop, an exit, and a profit target. Now, if it's good for the goose to the upside, it should be good for the gander to the downside. So a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio from the close, if you look at the distance here and you add the distance there, we're talking maybe 255, somewhere right back where the whole party started. Get rid of this right here, and that's where it started. All right, that's what we're kind of looking at. 255 minimum objective, somewhere right into the zone here, minimum objective. Except for here's the problem, guys. If at the end of the month of August, we've got, oops, oops, that's right. We have a monthly doji right there, and if we close the end of August below that line in the sand, it's not positive. That's what I was re referencing today uh, or in this week's newsletter, IGV. You take a look at this, same story. How many stocks, how many sectors have the exact same pattern with a weekly sell signal, but last month they formed a high of the whole move with a doji? Now, that's not a sell signal in itself, but it does show indecision. So there were tons of stocks and sectors that formed doji patterns for the absolute high. Now, that's what I'm talking about as probably one of my biggest wall of worries. So at, at one point last week, XLY, uh, let's look at the consumer discretionary. Same story, XLY. It's looking like almost so many different stocks have that same pattern. Double check, LUV. Well, this is a little bit different because it generated a weekly sell signal and it wasn't trending up, but there's your monthly doji. Nonetheless, another monthly doji. So there's that's what I'm referencing. So here we have the market opening right, right now, DIA. Um, there's where the market has gapped lower. Where um, I got, uh, what would that be? Another 500 points to hit the one-to-one -one risk reward uh, objective. Margin call liquidations, give it a couple more days. Again, this is not a... In my humble opinion, we don't want to be looking to buy the dip on a lot of things, but I think we want to look at buying a fictitious dip. In other words, if the market got down here, what stocks are not going out of business that will still do business that you'd want to own, that pay a dividend, and that I don't think that we're going to at this point enter into a major global depression. So at one point, things will come uh, great and, and, and work and mesh together. So at this point in time, personally, I'm not looking to get short on this lower gap open. Last week I said, uh, at least on Friday, if you were in the live trading room, it was recorded. You can go check out the recordings. I said, guys, this market, just, just look for sell signals because we are, we did break. And in the spiders, SPY, SPY, A daily, weekly close, as I wrote about last week, below 296 should make a move right down into somewhere into this support zone right in there. And that's where we're currently trading. So that's that's, that's a little ugly. Uh, and and yet, I think that in if we look at the rest of the market and the rest of the tape here, guys, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, a company like Kohl's, so let's take a look at our, our um, and then we'll move into this right away. So let's see, where is it? Oh boy. Last, um, and, and you know, it goes without saying, uh, over the weekend, I mean, you just don't like to come into weekends hearing about disastrous mass shootings, no matter, it's just, it's, it is amazing. And I, I can't understand, I'm, a, you know, I'm a, you know, I believe in a lot of our, our um, rights and the right for gun ownership, but I, I have, my wife, I'm not allowed to own a gun, by the way. So um, I'm one of those guys that um, by virtue of being married, I'm just not allowed to have a gun. And so what's the point I'm making? Um, I think that if you're a hunter and you have a 30 odd six or you got a 12 gauge and you live on a farm, hey, uh, that's awesome. You're right to bear arms. I get that too. But what I don't get is how you go to a gun store and you need a background check, but you go to a gun flea market and you need no background check. And to me, that's 
insanity. It just doesn't. It's one of those laws that why hasn't this been taken care of? I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're a staunch gun owner. Do you want nut jobs out there running around our country being able to get guns? I mean, kids that have um, gone through high school, like what happened not only in Columbine, but look what happened here in Parkland, South Florida. Um, I mean, that, that were able to buy guns. Look what happened out in, in, in uh, California. The kid bought the gun in Vegas. I think there should be accountability, number one. And I don't want to give you my opinion, and I know it's a very, very tough subject, but why not have background checks? What's the harm? You can still do business. I'm not saying people can't do business. And, and in terms of the Godfather movie, Don Corleone, hey, you know, I don't care what a man does for a business, for, for, for a career in his business. You know, it doesn't matter to me as long as it doesn't conflict with my interest. But selling a gun to a nut job and having him go around killing people, that conflicts with my interest because I could be one of those people. And I think that responsible people have the ability and the right to, arm, to, to own guns. So I, I just definitely say thoughts and prayers to our nation. Please get your act together, Washington. Please get your act together. Do something here. And I think President Trump uh, probably will do something. And, uh, and, and, and I mean, he's not one to, I don't think, has gotten a lot of political uh, donations from the National Rifle Association. So I'm not sure where that, that all stands. Anyway, enough of my little rant there this morning. What I wanted it to point out to you guys, and, and you know what? Give me a, let me know how you feel about that. You can do it anonymous. Uh, if you'd like, but I, I think it's kind of important that we uh, all take, you know, a look at that. I mean, if you live in, in Tennessee, like my father, if you live in, in, in Texas, like a lot of my friends, a lot of friends, I mean, that's gun country right there. Don't mess with these people's guns. But I think a lot of them also would say, yeah, we need some responsible um gun laws for for selling guns to to people and the background check is is you know what's the what's the deal of waiting so all right um let's see what i'd like to point out to you is that when we get into the the market right now at least retail kohl's this is uh first and foremost let's take a gander here department stores uh kohl's uh down 93 cents what do we need we need a lower open is this a stock that has a lot to lose? It already got its ass kicked. It's there's not it, it there's not much left here to lose, and its relative strength versus the overall market longer term volume. To me, I think this is that dip is certain things you want to look for a buying opportunity, and that's where I'm at with looking at Kohl's H E S. Like this week, I said here's a fictitious order. In fact, Hess. I said it has to crash in order to get long. I put up what I call a potential fictitious order to buy Hess at 55. So I need the market to get back to the area where it was in April back there to buy. So I'm not telling you I can't really sell it. I want to look at for overall market weakness to buy this stock in here. That's what I'm looking at Hess. And as far as looking at biotech, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of stocks, like, for example, this week, Cardinal Health has earnings out this week. Cardinal Health. Cardinal Health didn't even, I mean, what is it down? 24 whole cents in this crash? So I'm not sure I'm a, a, a staunch bear. The equity markets, the overall equity markets, the indexes, they can go and they are under pressure. But a lot of individual stocks, let's not, let's not look at this smoke screen that the market wants to throw up and say all's uh, bearish and get short. Cardinal Health, uh, THC is not your cannabis stuff. It's tenant health care. Tenant health care. Um, you know, I'm not saying to rush out this morning and, and get long this stock, but are you serious? It's down 26 cents as well. It's at 22. I think that there is a lot of capabilities for uh, upside in the health care, not just health care facilities, but also health care, drug, and biotech sector. Here is a cell gene down 36 cents had a great week last week so i think the focus for me is to get out of high flying overpopulated um stocks that are a little overvalued that can get prone to mass liquidation margin call selling and then roll into the underperforming stocks that are starting to show out performance and look here on sell gene for me um the relative strength is bright blue the volume indicator is starting to perk its head a little bit um, all right, uh, 
Head and shoulders, not sure, but boy, I, I, I tell you what, it looks more of a bottoming pattern than a topping pattern. So again, stocks that go up and the relative strength and the volume doesn't look good, uh, you know, sell them. Stocks that are entering strong seasonality that might have some good buying opportunity, uh, take advantage of this dip to buy. That's what I'm saying here for this week. As far as short-term trading, let the algos take over. Last week, the 15-minute and the 5-minute models in the algos went crazy. What I did on the new version of Algo 17, folks, so let's double check because I know we covered this and it was on the video recording. So let me just go up and copy a window and let me hit paste and I'll bring this into um, recording view. All right. So what did I say last week? This is a model that is based on with an increase, how are we adjust, adjusting volatility? So these blue, there's your short. This is two lots. It got out. That was the Jerome Powell sell-off. This was the uh, market recovery buy. This was the President Trump de debacle, all right? This was Thursday. The market went long. We had great volume. These were our compression stops that we used on the new ALGO program. Uh, this is, again, it flips between the dynamic using a combination of average true range and last conditional changes. So it's a moving average of both, right? And it's very advanced, but it allows you to optimize to find out which one's better. Again, as I wanted to point out into the room, if you weren't here, if you missed it, go see that video. Let's go over here and I'm going to format the strategy real quick. So again, ALGO 17 version 2. What does this do? Well, it only these are the models that only trade while we're in the trade room. And by the way, last week I said, guys, anytime you get a really big move overnight, real big trend, whether it's crude oil, British pound, whatever, generally we walk into the market during the next day or during the open outcry session, we're going to get caught with chop and slop. So look to see what the market performance did before you just turn on the signal and use the signals now to confirm. Don't put auto execution, especially going into this morning, because we had already this huge lower open move and we could get caught in a little maybe uh, light ATR trading range while the market digests what the hell's going on. Last week was too big of a week for profitability standpoint um, and the, the trades were unreal. What I wanted to point out is simply this. The last conditional change exit. I said this in the, uh, we did also a webinar last Thursday night. There was a few glitches. One of the glitches our home-based office here is in um, on U.S. Highway 1 in South Florida. Uh, and we had Bank America put in new ATM machines, and they kind of cut the, the, the cable lines for the, the, the neighborhood, the whole block. They had five or six of these heavy-duty trucks out there. So we went, um, that's, a, that's an issue, right, and, and power loss. And then we got these massive storms that are coming through South Florida right now. If you looked at the map, it's like the one place you don't want to be is here. Or maybe other parts of the Midwest where we just had these horrific thunderstorms and lightning storms. And those blow up, tend to like, I don't know, blow up transformers. So we lose power, electricity, things of that nature. So it is, there, there are those issues. So the room might go down. I just want to warn you about that. So if it does, it's not because, you know, I just hit the wrong button. We have power outages. And I know Andy W. in the room, he picked up and, and started to project because he kind of caught that. So my point is that Thursday night, while we were doing a presentation, we had a little issue and we went out. I think the recordings were lost. In that, on that session, and this is the point, on that session, I said, last conditional change. This is a phenomenal strategy, last conditional change, how we developed it, how we came out and put it out in the book, copy wrote that. The last conditional change works for higher time frame, like 60-minute daily, weekly trade signals. The dynamic exit, this works phenomenal as we combine last conditional change with an ATR function. This is a compression exit. This is a little complex for that I want to go over right this minute with you. But my point is dynamic exit and compression exits interact between the two. And you can optimize these two. And you can actually optimize all three. 
and find out what your back test study shows what's more profitable using last conditional change dynamic compression. What we have found in our work and the reason that we added this to the ALGO program is for short term day trading compression exit works best. A combination of dynamic and compression works dramatically better especially when used in conjunction with trailing a stop. Now this program in the 15 minute gets out of half your position and trails the balance. What does it trail? It uses, it has a, a combination of dynamic as well as the compression. The dynamic are gray and the compression are yellow. So you got both systems as I shared with you up and running. Gray, yellow, gray, yellow, gray, and boom, gray. And so the, the, uh, the dynamic is more of a function of last conditional changes and a TR. And so if the market goes all the way down here, I don't want to get stopped out all the way up there. I want the compression which tightens up the ATR as the market goes through both price and time. That's what we've created here on this version. That's why the ALGO 17 version 2 light years ahead of everything else I've ever done. And, and that's, that's what it is. So does this help us when we go into a trend mode? If you have a high ATR or rate of change in the markets, which we are now into, because markets go down a lot farther and a lot faster than markets go up generally. We've seen an expansion of ATR right now in the S&Ps. So now with that said, if you have a profit target and your system is getting out at half your profit target, then the balance being trailing and scaling is going to take over and that's where you're going to see better performance. We just use in the room two lot models. You can use 10 lots if you have the equity to do so. So last um, Friday when the market we started to calm down, but again, we said daily closes, not good guys. We're closing below that 296. You know I said this in the room. More than likely, we're going to find early weakness next week. And then what are we going to do? Margin call liquidation and probably stabilize. We'll see if we stabilize midweek and the world comes to their senses. So at this point in time, looking at the 15 minute algo program here, got out of half and it never really went down. So it got out, it went short and it immediately got out. It went long and got out. And it, if this market continued to go up forever, it would have trailed your stop on the balance, but it still knocked out some really incredible trades last week. Now, why won't it take a trade right now? Because we walk in the door and Again, this thing doesn't even start till about nine in the morning. Well, by nine in the morning, gee whiz, guys, the market's already gone down and it's already been in sell mode. So it's probably got, not going to generate any new trades uh, for a while. Unfortunately, I want to warn everyone, the ALGO program will more than likely, it's more set up because it's gone down. It's now setting up for maybe a short-term buy signal. And I, I quite frankly, I'm not sure I'm, a, I'm all in on that trade setup. Um, but again, if you're an algo trader and you had great performance, what I would so strongly recommend is that after prolonged periods of declines, yeah, we'll get little dead cat bounces. What I don't like in the market, and I throw my two cents in, good, bad, or indifference, I throw my two cents in. If this market generally today, friends, if, if it just sits here and chops around, uh, we're going to get the system more than likely will get chopped up. You'll take false buy breakouts, you'll take false sell signals, and it's going to get chopped up. And your equity curve looks like this. Well, I'll show you. The equity curve performance graph looks like this. I mean, you can see we had a nice, uh, you know, 45 degree trend in profitability with this model, right? And it just went straight up. Now, what do you think is going to happen like any chart? You might get a either sideways drawdown or you're going to get a just absolute drawdown. So let's say you weren't trading last week and you go, oh, look at this thing. It's going to keep going up forever. Um, maybe not. That's the point I'm trying to make. So anytime we see systems that go in that, that much of average profits are exceeded, and you get away from its normal equity curve trend, it, you tend to maybe see drawdowns. So wait for this thing to pull back because the market conditions themselves. And I hope this makes interwoven logic. I hope this makes sense because 
just like an equity curve markets. When markets go parabolic, right, they go into cor correction mode. And what happens after a, a trend? Correction mode is called Chop City, and that's where we lose money, Chop City. And this is where if you have a nice trend system, your equity curve goes up, and then all of a sudden you're going to be uh, down and out and giving back profit. So that's why I say right now for this week, Monday, Tuesday, maybe we get, you know, backside of, of more jargon within the, the, the you know, uh, political wrangle with China trade war discussion. Markets will get a better clarity. Right now, we're also under the influence of margin call liquidation, margin call pressures. And so, the, you know, the guys with cash that are sitting on the sidelines, they're drooling, waiting to pick up some equity positions here in stocks that make sense. The guys that are already long from the highs, they're like scuffling right now, and they're trying to you know, figure out what they can liquidate to save their best uh, products going forward. So this is where we can get into a little bit of trouble for um, as traders this week. So watch for maybe what we call uh, consolidation in the market, and I want to be very um, leery of what stocks to um sell short but then on the other side of the coin there's a lot of things that i want to I, I would like to buy on the low end so anyway i'm being redundant uh, i hope that makes sense here's steve Wynn. uh Wynn gave that sell signal for the week gap lower open it's tough to take advantage of a lower gap open like this you just can't do it the monthly look at the monthly chart there it is the doji a lot of combinations that i saw with stocks that generated weekly sell with monthly potential monthly sell signals uh, that's, uh, I'm not saying that's going to lead us up to the Mike C bizarre correction of all time, but it definitely, it, it tells me that we've got maybe some, maybe 90 days, three months worth of downside action. Uh, possibly. It depends on how we come out of this week. Here's Twitter. Do I feel bad we got out of Twitter? To a degree, yes. Uh, we trailed, we were long the stock. We trailed our stop. They knocked us out and took off again by, I don't know, a buck or two. Um, I think Twitter has a strong chance of maybe getting back. I, I'm not going to watch it right now. Um, I, you know, but I'll watch it, give it an, like the end of the week. But I got my eye more like right into that zone right there for Twitter, the midpoint of this benchmark. You know, uh, we had a big breakout here and everyone loved the stock and bought the high and then bang, it pulled back again. Twitter has a consistent habit of doing that. So I would be more interested in buying Twitter maybe sometime down the road, but not today and not at that price. Thank you all for listening. I hope that uh, helped explain A, our positions, B, what, um, what I'm looking to do on new positions, and how are we addressing what's going on with the markets. Uh, I did want to uh, make sure I reemphasize. Last week, TLT, the options on the 131-128 spread, uh, those were worth 85 cents. We paid a buck five for it. In one, two days, thanks to President Trump's tweet. Nope, I mean, it's just where it was. This market really in, in, in TLT, and this is my bad, and I should know better being a 38-year or bond veteran in the market. For me, uh, this market had the weekly sell signal mode, low closed OG. I mean, this, this is why I was in more of an option and a very um, precautious trade meaning 131 and a 128 spread. And literally, you know, we in just a few days worth of action, everything got negated. This market had the potential. And when I say 72% uh, of the time the low closed OG works, well, this is 28% uh, of the time it doesn't. Well, that's one of that time. That's why since it's not 100% guaranteed, you don't go all in on any trade. So uh, I, if I got you... On the short side, and we gave back some profits on that, on, on your overall performance for this year, I, I will we'll work harder at making things better. But thank you all, and uh, have a great uh, trading week. I'll be here with you all week, and not every minute in the live trading room, but I'll definitely be here when it's important in the room. I might not be here every minute of the day, but I tend to be around when it's important. Thank you, guys. Have a great week.